Welcome to this lecture on impedance control of robot manipulators. As we have seen, impedance control is one of the two main type of control design that is being pursued in order to handle the interaction between the robot, in particular the robot and the factor, and the environment uh, with which this and the factor is in contact. Uh, it is best suited for situation in which the environment uh, undergoes small, although finite, deformation at the contact. So this design uh, is not suited for situation where we know in advance that the environment is very stiff. Uh, we will uh, analyze uh, the design of such a control law, which essentially goes through uh, a sequence of two steps. The first steps uh, the first step is a feedback realization control. The second uh, step is the assignment of a desired behavior, which is made through a suitable chosen uh, reference model, which is exactly called the impedance model. We will see the various uh, application and variants that can be realized, uh, and then we will make some simplification uh, that reduces the general scheme to a more simplified one. So, uh, impedance control imposes, in fact, a dynamic interaction between the robot and the factor and the environment. We are not explicitly controlling the contact force, we are not explicitly controlling uh, the motion at the contact, but in fact, we uh, choose a reference model which relates forces and displacement at the contact. This reference model is uh, chosen as a generalized um, system made of a mass, spring and damper in each direction of the Cartesian space. The choice of the parameters uh, in this impedance model uh, is made accordingly to some uh, desired characteristic of the transient and of the uh, contact force that should be uh, set under control. These systems are typically linear, but also nonlinear version of such uh, reference model uh, can be considered. In this context, uh, we are not modeling explicitly the way in which reaction forces are being generated by the environment in response to uh, a small deformation. So we are not assuming that the environment behaves like uh, a linear spring or simple model as that. We don't require this. In fact, for some stability analysis, analysis we will make some assumption of this kind. Uh, because of the uncertainty which is typically associated with a compliant environment, both in position, orientation and in the compliance characteristics, uh, there is no way of uh, regulating contact force using impedance control. So the main objective is to limit uh, the amplitude of the contact force. In fact, we will see that there are cases in which we are also allow not to measure the force at the contact. So since we are not measuring in some situation this contact force, we cannot even regulate that value closing uh, force feedback loop. So since uh, there is no force error loop in this scheme, uh, the contact force are resulting from the motion uh, that we are imposing through the dynamic impedance scheme. And in particular, when we choose uh, some parameters in the dynamic impedance, in particular uh, we specify a specific stiffness in the, in the, in the spring of the um, impedance model, this results in a trade-off between how accurate we would like to achieve uh, a position with respect to how large the contact forces uh, are allowed to arise. So, uh, the setting is the usual one. So we have our uh, Lagrangian uh, 
uh, model on the right and on the left hand side of the model uh, of the equation. Uh, on the right hand side we have the generalized forces produced by the equators and new forces which are the forces arising due to, to the contact. There is a Jacobian transpose uh, which in general associates uh, the forces and momentum at the contact uh, to the equivalent joint torques. Now a consideration should be made at this stage. Uh, we have seen that uh, we can model uh, a robot which is constrained to a given geometric uh, surface at the end of factor level, for instance. In that case, on the right hand side, we have seen that the Jacobian of the constraint appears. Now, this is instead uh, the Jacobian of the robot. It could be the geometric Jacobian of the robot, or, as we will see uh, in a moment, also the analytic Jacobian. So what is the difference between these two models? In one case, the forces that arise, in fact, they are qualified as Lagrange multiplier lambda, are, uh, appear on the right hand side, uh, pre-multiplied by the transpose of the Jacobian associated to the constraint, which means that uh, we can only consider forces applied, for instance, at the end of factor, which are generated by the attempt violate this constraint. So, for instance, the direction in which these forces are being uh, exerted are related to the geometry of the environment. In this model, instead, we assume that uh, forces may be applied in any forces and momentum, so generalized forces, may be applied at the end of factor by the environment in any direction. So there is more freedom associated to this. We are not uh, really constraining the end effect or to belong to a geometric surface. So, with this in mind, uh, we have the generalized Cartesian force added on the right hand side of the dynamic model. We assume that there are n uh, joint coordinates in this uh, dynamic model, and we make the following, uh, uh, give the following definition, and remem we remember also a number of relations. So the force may contain, the generalized force F, may contain linear forces and torques, gamma and mu, uh, in a number which is M with M less or equal than 6 in case. So we are, if we are considering the full set of uh, generalized forces, so three forces and three torques, M will be equal to 6. Otherwise it could be even less. Now, these forces are performing work on generalized velocity. So, if we take the six-dimensional case, uh, we would have uh, a generalized velocity which is composed by the linear velocity v, a three-dimensional vector, and the angular velocity omega. And indeed, this uh, six-dimensional uh, generalized velocity is connected to the joint velocity q dot by the geometric Jacobian. Now, we remember that while the linear velocity is the time derivative of uh, the position of the end effector in this case, uh, the angular velocity omega is a vector which is not uh, equal to the derivative of a minimal representation of orientation, for instance, using uh, Euler angles. So there is a difference between omega and phi dot. While, uh, P dot, which is equal to V, and phi dot can be obtained uh, with an uh, analytic differentiation of the direct kinematics from the joint space to this quantities P and phi. So uh, this analytic Jacobian will be defined here as JA times P dot. Now, uh, there is indeed a relationship between the uh, geometric Jacobian that we use in the first equation the dynamic model on the right hand side and the analytic Jacobian which for this presentation will be preferred uh, for a number of reasons. So we know that uh, uh, Jacobian, the analytic Jacobian can be obtained through uh, uh, the product of a matrix which is related to the particular set of uh, angles that we are using for representing the orientation so a matrix Ta of phi to the, uh, to the geometric Jacobian. Uh, 
we have also defined uh, singularity of the robot structure as the singularity of the geometric Jacobian. Uh, the analytic Jacobian has additional singularity, which are those of the minimal representation of, uh, of the minimal representation of the uh, orientation. Okay, so uh, with this in mind, we can also substitute to the right hand side of our equation. Uh, instead of using the geometric Jacobian, we can use the analytic Jacobian. Uh, the dimensions are the same in, in, in dealing with this type of representation, but indeed uh, we will have on the right hand side not the forces and torques uh, acting on, on, on the end effector, but in fact a modification of these uh, quantities which is related to the principle of virtual work. So we will have generalized for forces that perform work not on capital V, but on uh, X dot. One or the other can be used. I prefer to use the analytic Jacobian in the following. And we will comment uh, why this is uh, more convenient and more practical in a sense. So, uh, remember also that uh, we have developed a, a dynamic model in Cartesian coordinates. So, if we rewrite the full model in the presence of a contact uh, in Cartesian coordinates, and from now on we will assume that the number of joints is equal to the number of uh, coordinates in the Cartesian space, and in particular the number of generalized forces that can act on the system, so that the analytic Jacobian is square, then uh, the uh, full model in Cartesian coordinate can be rewritten in this mixed form. You see that the argument of the vector Gx of the matrix Sx and of the inertia matrix in the Cartesian space M of x are still function of q and q dot because we typically model the system in the joint space and make the transformation uh, to uh, deal with Cartesian quantities. So in fact the uh, Cartesian inertia matrix is obtained from the joint space inertia matrix by pre-multiplication by uh, the uh, inverse transpose of the analytic Jacobian and post-multiplication by the inverse Jacobian and similarly for the other terms and we know that there are some usual structural properties holding so that uh, the Cartesian inertia of the robot is positive definite as long as I would say if and only if uh, the Jacobian is non singular, the analytic Jacobian is non singular. Also, uh, the Cartesian inertia and the factorization of the colorless and centrifugal form of terms in the Cartesian space satisfy the skew symmetric property. So, m dot minus 2sx is skew symmetric. And the full model can be linearly parameterized in terms of a set of dynamic coefficients. We will not use the latter properties, but the previous one uh, is important. Why we refer to the dynamic model in the Cartesian coordinate? Simply because now on the right hand side, the uh, uh, forces that, uh, the generalized forces that act on the other factor appear uh, directly without any matrix multiplying them. And because the problem of interacting with the environment is in fact a problem well defined in the Cartesian space. So we start with this model for designing our control law, and then when we end up with the final expression of the control, we try to simplify terms and see what can be rewritten in terms of uh, joint space quantities. So the, the design of uh, an impedance control law is based on two steps. The first step is feedback linearization in Cartesian space, which we have already done, but now we will uh, consider uh, the presence of a force and, in general, of a force measure. So we assume for the time being that we have a force sensor mounted on the end effector, which is capable of measuring any contact force applied beyond the force or sensor. Now, feedback linearization is very simple if we look at the Cartesian model. So we just cancel the Cartesian 
dynamic terms of gravity, Gx, the Cartesian term related to uh, velocity, so Sx times x dot, and uh, we introduce a new uh, signal A, which is an acceleration in the Cartesian space, pre-multiplied by the inertia, uh, by the Cartesian inertia. In addition, we eliminate any force that we may measure at the contact. Uh, all this has the dimension of a Cartesian generalized force, so in order to apply the torque at the joint level where the motors are present, we pre-multiply this by the Jacobian transpose. The result uh, is that the acceleration uh, at the Cartesian level is equal to the new signal A, so we have obtained uh, a closed loop system at this stage, which is made by double integrator between the new input and each component of the Cartesian acceleration, uh, despite of the presence of a contact force, because we have removed it by control. Indeed, we cannot really expect to let now uh, the end effector accelerate in any direction freely, uh, unless we tolerate forces that become uh, incredibly large when we are trying to enter in, into a uh, compliant but at some point uh, resisting uh, environment. So some completion of this control law should be made in the choice of A. And this is, this is in fact what happens when we specify, when we impose uh, an impedance model which is our reference behavior. In this model uh, there are several terms. So the model uh, prescribed the way in which external forces coming from the environment, the one that we have measured and subtracted in the feedback linearization control law, uh, interact with a reference trajectory specified uh, at the end of factor level in terms of a position xt, its velocity xt dot and its acceleration, and the actual position velocity acceleration of the end of factor pre-multiplied this uh, variation of behavior by an apparent desired inertia, a desired damping, and a desired stiffness. So these uh, are positive definite or semi-definite in case of the damping uh, matrices, which are typically chosen as diagonal. So this specify for each direction, generalized direction in the Cartesian space, the way in which we would like uh, the robot to interact with the environment. As you can see, there is no information on how external forces are coming. The only thing that we are saying that is that we are measuring them with a force torque sensor. Now, there are many things to have to specify in this general structure, namely, what is, why, uh, um, how do we choose the element on the diagonal of the three matrix and why are we choosing them in, in a particular way, how to define a reference trajectory uh, when we are in contact or in the vicinity of uh, uh, the surface of the environment, uh, and so on. So, but we'll leave this uh, on the side for a moment and uh, make a choice of the auxiliary input A in order to match this model. How do we do this? Simply we replace to x double dot in the impedance model that we have chosen uh, the value A and then we solve for A. If we do this, uh, what happens is that we uh, assign to A the following uh, expression the desired acceleration plus some gain which is the resultant between the inverse of the apparent uh, inertia that we are imposing uh, times the desired damping and the velocity error. Uh, same story with uh, a desired stiffness times the position error plus again the measured force. So the force appeared twice, once in the feedback linearization control and the other in the choice of the desired acceleration uh, of the acceleration input A uh, uh, in order to match the impedance model. 
Uh, now, one thing that we immediately specify is how to choose the desired motion. Now, when we are, when we would like to keep contact, because the main intention here is to keep contact and move in contact while uh, keeping contact forces uh, limited. But the main address, the main uh, addressed issue here is that we would like to keep contact and the environment is a bit compliant. So it's kind of natural to choose the desired motion, the reference motion, that we will not be able to replicate because of the presence of the environment, slightly inside the uh, compliant environment. So this will induce some contact forces, and these contact forces will help to keep the end effector in contact with uh, the environment surface. So let's do uh, some example of how, I mean, qualitative example of how the desired reference can be chosen in impedance and also later on in compliance control, which is uh, a subclass of this impedance scheme. So this is the model. Uh, for instance, uh, when the robot uh, is doing a, a grinding task, now this task, suppose that the uh, involved component, the robot, the tool and the surface are relatively stiff. Still, we can impose some compliant behavior by the choice of an impedance model. In this case, uh, we have a contact point, let's denote this X of E, and we have a desired trajectory while the robot is doing the grinding, so while it's moving the tool in contact with the uh, metallic surface, which moves a little bit beyond the surface. Uh, so there will be some error and this will be counteracted by the forces that arises due to the contact. And the way in which this reaction forces from the environment to the, to the end effect of the robot uh, interact with the motion of the and the factor is specified by the impedance model. Uh, this is a, another uh, schematic example in which we have a surface which is uh, supposed to be compliant and also not linear. So we have a, a curved surface, uh, the robot is mounting a, a, a tool, uh, in between we have also a four-star sensor and uh, the tip of the tool should follow a path on the surface of this environment. But in fact, the reference trajectory is designed according to the surface itself, but a little bit inside uh, the uh, geometric surface. Uh, indeed, the end effector will not be able to reach the desired trajectory, so we will leave with this position error but associated to this position error, because of the imposed uh, impedance model, we will have also some contact forces uh, implied, and these contact forces will guarantee that the end effector keeps continuous contact with the environment. And by the choice of the parameter in the impedance model, we will also make sure that this force is not too large if we have tuned well the parameter. Uh, another example uh, is uh, the following one, in which we consider a constant desired pose. So the trajectory vanishes into a, a constant xd, so x double dot desired and x dot desired goes to zero. And for instance, this is the situation in which uh, an impedance model can be assigned to the interaction between uh, the end effector of the robot and a human operator moving around uh, the end effect. So the force now is being applied in an autonomous way. We don't know where and how, in which direction, and what will be the intensity, by a human operator that is carrying around the end effector. The desired configuration is the, the one at this contact and you can see that when the human is uh, moving uh, the end effector in different direction, 
it will generate an error with respect to the reference uh, value xd and in response to this the robot will uh, generate the contact forces according to the uh, impedance model. So if we make the system very stiff in one direction then the human will feel uh, the need of a high force in order to have the same amount of displacement. Uh, if we, in another direction the stiffness will be the desired stiffness, so in the impedance model, will be uh, low, then it will be very easy to displace the end effector from the reference position XD by the human, so the human will have to apply less force, and so on. Indeed, increasing the inertia, uh, the apparent inertia, will let the human feel a very heavy uh, robot end effector to be moved. And vice versa, if we reduce the uh, apparent inertia, uh, the feeling will be to move a, a very light object, the feeling from the human operator side. And the same uh, is in case of collaboration, so it's not manual guidance uh, by the human robot, by the human operator. And this uh, picture, which is taken from a video, of a collaborative task uh, that we implemented on a lightweight robot, KUKA lightweight robot in our uh, laboratory. Uh, a human is uh, applying the force and the system is being programmed with an impedance at the contact point. The contact point in this case may not be the end effector, it could be any point along the structure. And we use a, a specific model-based method in order to estimate the contact force and then possibly to regulate this contact force even without the use of a sensor. So this goes into a separate chapter of our program, uh, Collaboration in Human-Robot Interaction Task, but uh, we can implement an impedance method also in this case with the extra characteristic that we are doing this at any contact point, not necessarily at the end effector level, which is the standard way in which impedance control is being designed. Okay, so uh, when we move the contact point uh, from the reference constant position, we will uh, induce uh, this type of uh, impedance behavior. Now, uh, with this in mind, so having chosen uh, a model and having chosen a reference position or a trajectory slightly inside the surface with which the robot and effector needs to be in contact, uh, we substitute the acceleration A into the feedback linearizing control, we get rid of all the Cartesian terms, we rewrite them in terms of the uh, original model term, so the inertia in the joint space, the uh, factorization of the cordialis and centrifugal term in the joint space, the gravity in the joint space, and we see that there are additional terms. Uh, in the first line of this expression, we have uh, after the inertia matrix and the inverse of the uh, analytic Jacobian, so that we are assuming that this Jacobian is squared, um, we have the desired acceleration coming from the impedance model, uh, we have a term that is related to the curvature of the Jacobian, so J dot, G dot. Uh, and then we have a PD-like term coming again from the parameter of the model. Uh, cancellation of uh, gravity and of uh, corollary centrifugal term. And in addition, pre-multiplied by the transpose, pay attention only by the transpose in the second uh, row of the control law, uh, the second line of the control law, pre-multiplied with Jacobian transpose, we have uh, a special product, the Cartesian inertia uh, of the robot, multiplied by the inverse of the desired or apparent inertia, minus the identity, multiplied by uh, the measured contact force. So this matrix is weighting the measured contact force. In general, if this is the situation, 
we will need to measure contact force. So we will need to carry a force to our sensor on the end effector for implementing impedance control. But we will see that we can also simplify these steps. Uh, in particular, if we look at this last term in the control law, while the other terms, apart from those coming from the uh, impedance model, uh, are all written in uh, joint space term, uh, we can rewrite also this term by uh, remembering the expression of the Cartesian uh, inertia matrix. And in fact, uh, in this identity, uh, we end up with a, a control which is all expressed in joint coordinates. Remember that we design the behavior and we cancel the dynamic term in the Cartesian space, so using the Cartesian dynamic model and using an impedance model which is defined in the Cartesian space, but eventually we need to impose a joint torque at the joint level and it's convenient to use uh, all dynamic terms expressed uh, in terms of the generalized coordinate Q and their derivative Q dot. So, uh, this is the full picture. Uh, now, uh, this is in fact uh, what I just commented on the implementation of the control law. Now we turn our interest uh, on the choice of the impedance model. So, what is the idea behind it? First of all, as, as I said, there is no regulation of contact forces, uh, we would like to avoid impact forces when we enter in contact and large reaction forces when we keep contact. Uh, and this large impact and large forces may be due to the uncertain geometric characteristic of the environment. So geometric in the sense of where we enter into contact with the environment and how is the environment oriented with respect to the end effector of the road. This is one aspect. The other aspect is that we would like to adapt the robot behavior to the dynamic characteristic of the environment. So, uh, stated in a simple way, we would like to have a complementarity. The more stiff is the environment, the more soft should be the behavior of the robot and the control should achieve this target. On the other hand, the more stiff, uh, sorry, the more um, uh, soft is the environment, the stiffer can be the robot in pursuing the, its desired trajectory. In the limit, in the direction where the environment is so soft that there is no environment at all, so there is free motion, we could be infinitely stiff. Uh, complementary in the direction where we expect to encounter a very stiff environment, the controller will comply completely. So we will not attempt to uh, reach the zero desired position, but will uh, let the force, the contact force, remain low by reducing its own stiffness. And all these aspects are uh, realized by the proper choice of the apparent inertia of the uh, desired stiffness and as a consequence of the desired damping in the impedance model. And in fact, we can also have a bio-inspired uh, choice uh, by looking at how we move uh, our arm in the presence of uncertain geometry. We tends to be fast and stiff when we move our arm in free motion, but when we expect some contact, so we are proceeding with a guarded motion, we will be slower and more compliant. Okay? And by slower and faster, fast we associate essentially the equivalent mass that we like to move, by stiff and compliant we associate the uh, desired stiffness stiffness in the various direction. So, uh, those Cartesian direction where we expect to have a contact, we will cho choose a large apparent inertia component, M of M i, i is the generalized component, let's consider for the time being only linear direction, 
So uh, in a direction where we expect to hit a wall, we will use a, a large inertia in the prescribed closed loop behavior, that, which means that the system will reduce its acceleration and speed. And at the same time, we will use a small uh, desired stiffness because when we will enter into contact, this will let the uh, robot uh, comply uh, more, uh, in a more clear way with respect to the environment. So this will generate low contact forces. On the other hand, in the direction where we expect the motion to be free, we will do exactly the reverse. So we will have small apparent inertia so that we can accelerate very quickly and a large stiffness gain so that we will follow a desired trajectory which has this component uh, free to move, we will uh, follow it uh, with good tracking properties. Now once we have chosen uh, these two uh, quantities in every Cartesian direction, we will complete the choice by uh, selecting the damping coefficient which on a second order system will guarantee, for instance, no overshooting or uh, uh, smooth transient behavior without oscillation. So the damping coefficient is typically chosen at the end of the process, considering the second order mechanical system like this. Now, uh, indeed, uh, this is one aspect, so low uh, contact forces and good tracking, low contact forces in the direction where we expect contact and good tracking in the free direction. And this choice, as I anticipated in my introductory part, I uh, suggest that we should know something about the geometry of the environment. We cannot be completely blind to it. Because otherwise, if we expect in a direction that one direction is uh, completely free for moving the end effector, while instead there's a hard wall in that direction, uh, the choice of a bad impedance model will be uh, a disaster in terms of performance. So, uh, as I said, there's an another aspect that uh, is a generalization of what we have just said. And uh, here I'm using the uh, bio-inspired analogy. So, suppose that uh, you are in your room in, at home, but your senses are uh, not perfectly well tuned, probably you are moving in the dark, so you know where to expect, for instance, you want to uh, switch on the, uh, the light, uh, with the switch on the, on, on the wall, so you're moving your hand toward the wall and you expect in one direction that you may hit the wall before you expect the wall is very hard, so you have a guarded soft motion in that direction. So you move slowly and you're ready to comply with any contact. On the other hand, looking for the switch on the wall, so moving right and left, where you don't expect any contact, then you will be relatively fast and uh, relatively stiff in order to execute your command. So you see that this type of behavior is well fitted to uh, the expected uncertainty, but indeed, if your senses are completely off, you may expect that the wall is in a different direction. For instance, if you're coming late home at night, uh, a bit drunk, then your senses will certainly not be in perfect shape, although you have an idea of the geometry of your apartment, and then uh, some disaster may happen in the sense that you may hit and uh, damage your hand while, uh, while moving uh, in this situation. So you see that there's another aspect. If the wall would be there with the, its geometry but be soft, in fact, uh, we don't need to be so soft from the side of the motion contact. So there is a complementarity. The harder we expect the environment, the softer we are. And the 
slower we move. In the limit, a uh, fully hard environment, very slow motion, very compliant. So low desired stiffness in that direction. In the other direction, soft, uh, expected uh, soft environment or even no environment at all, which is the softest possible environment that we can think of, very low inertia, very fast speed, and very high stiffness, very large accuracy in prompt reproduction of a reference trajectory which is moving in the free direction. So, so this is uh, the idea behind uh, and it's a very successful idea. In fact, this idea was uh, introduced by Neville Hogan who developed both the biomechanics and bio-inspired concept and then its robotic application. Okay, so uh, this is the basic design. Now there are some uh, simplifications that we can introduce. The first simplification uh, essentially uh, concerns the choice of an apparent inertia which is not different from the natural Cartesian inertia at the contact, so at the end effect level, in all this presentation we assume that the contact occurs at this level. So we don't change this apparent inertia, which means that in our model, instead of using a diagonal constant uh, desired inertia m of m, we will keep the Cartesian inertia m of x of q. So uh, we are giving away the possibility of letting the system behave uh, faster or uh, slower by choosing the appropriate uh, apparent inertia. So we preserve the natural Cartesian inertia. So we are giving away some nice feature of the impedance model. But we win a, a very big uh, advantage, namely uh, in the matrix pre-multiplying the, um, the measured force in the control law, there was, uh, a, a, there was a, a factor m of x times m to the minus 1, m of m to the minus 1, minus the identity, and if we choose the apparent inertia exactly as the Cartesian one, the first term is an identity subtracted to another identity and uh, the measured force will vanish from the control law. So we can uh, achieve this modified impedance model, which is now a non-linear impedance model because the uh, inertia that we are imposing is a nonlinear function of the configuration of the robot is not a constant matrix. Uh, in this control law, we will not use uh, the contact force feedback, so we don't use uh, a, for a force torque sensor. So this is a, a very common implementation of uh, the impedance control law, uh, exactly for this reason. Now, if we look at this control law, uh, force has disappeared. And we see that apart from cancellation of nonlinearity, gravity, and Coriolis term, uh, the rest of the uh, control law is in fact has a PD structure with some feed forward acceleration. So it's a pure uh, motion control law in the Cartesian space. The only specific uh, aspect is that the parameters of the proportional and derivative term. So Km and Dm, now the inertia has been chosen as uh, the natural one of the robot in the Cartesian space, so the only parameter left are Km and Dm, and these are chosen in such a way that we expect limited contact forces in the direction where we uh, anticipate contact, and uh, good tracking in the direction where we expect uh, the environment to let the end effect free to move. Okay, so there is a, let's say, an interpretation of the standard PD gain in terms of uh, what we expect in the interaction with the environment. Now there's a, 
an additional technical issue, which is not clear in the beginning. If we are choosing an impedance model which has a configuration dependent inertia matrix, namely the Cartesian inertia matrix of the robot, then if this should correspond to a real mechanical system, mass spring, damper, or a generalization, a linear generalization of, of this, then we know that associated to a non-constant inertia, there should be also coherence and centripetal term, which are not present in an impedance model which has m of x of q as desired inertia, namely the real inertia of the robot at the end effector level, while the remaining part of the model contains just a constant stiffness and a constant damper. So this would not represent a real mechanical system. And as a consequence, some convergent properties of control laws that uses, for instance, the conservation of, uh, um, of energy, so some physical properties that allows to conclude about the stability of some control law would be lost when we are imposing this type of behavior. Something strange may happen, or possibly may not happen, but we cannot exclude that something strange will happen. So, uh, if we want to be accurate, and this is another type of simplification that we introduce, we should include uh, a fully nonlinear impedance model, which, beside the uh, actual Cartesian inertia, M of X, includes also a term which uh, carries over uh, the factorization of the coherence and centrifugal terms, so the matrix S of X, which will multiply a velocity term in the Cartesian space, in fact, a velocity error term. So only the gravity has disappeared uh, from, from the picture. Now, if we redo the computation by assigning, so by doing feedback linearization first, so this is a conceptual scheme. We do feedback linearization because we eliminate what is uh, unconvenient in a sense and we are left with a double integrator commanded by the signal A. Now the signal A, for x double dot equal A, uh, the new signal is chosen in such a way that we match the impedance model, in this case the nonlinear impedance model. We choose A in this way, and then we uh, introduce this in the original feedback linearization controller, and we see what happens. And what happens, the final control is uh, the one that uh, is shown in the uh, blue box, which is slightly more complex than before because we have included in the desired uh, behavior uh, even the colorless and centrifugal term, uh, but has uh, a few advantages. First of all, again, there is no need of measuring uh, contact force, so of using the force sensor in the impedance scheme because we are using the actual uh, Cartesian inertia in the impedance model. And uh, second, when there is no contact situation, so this is a, a conventional tracking controller uh, with a time varying x desired of t, so we can guarantee uh, using uh, the Abunov argument and the presence of this Q symmetric term and dot of x minus 2s of x into the derivative of the Lyapunov candidate, that we will get zero tracking error. So we have seen this before. We cancel gravity, and you can see that there are uh, all terms uh, that appear linearly are computed with the desired value of the Cartesian trajectory. And in fact, we will also have further simplification when the reference motion uh, included in the impedance model uh, degenerate into a, a constant. So if xd is in fact constant. In fact, in this case, uh, if we replace uh, xd dot equal zero and x double dot equal zero in the previous expression, we end up with a, a well-known uh, controller. In fact, this is a Cartesian PD control 
with gravity cancellation. We have already studied this uh, control law in the absence of contact. Remember that the fact that the control law does not include a measurement of the contact forces, it does not mean that there are no contact forces at all. But we know that in this case, when regulation uh, is chosen as uh, the desired trajectory in the impedance model, remember that we are simplifying the general impedance control law by making a number of uh, modification to the impedance model and to the reference motion, which is now constant. So, uh, when we are, have no contact, we already know that this control law achieves global asymptotic stability of the desired position Xt, provided that the Jacobian has full rank. We have seen this in the Cartesian control uh, analysis that we have already made. And uh, indeed, since we are now moving to the situation when we are transiting from a non-contact, uh, so free motion situation to a contact situation, uh, we should understand what happens in that case. We expect that we will not get asymptotic stability of the desired Xt because Xt is not even an equilibrium. In order to understand what happened, we can redo the same proof of the Cartesian PD control law with gravity cancellation by slightly modifying uh, the Lyapunov candidate. In fact, we are using the uh, we can use the as candidate the Cartesian kinetic energy of the robot and uh, an elastic term which uses the stiffness of the impedance model Km. If we do the computation and we do the substitution, we end up with a, a derivative of the Lyapunov candidate, which is a negative semi-definite, uh, and from there on, we could conclude we can conclude uh, using Lassalle uh, asymptotic stability of x of t if the contact force is absent. So if f a is equal to zero, what happens when? we have contact. And we are not using uh, the contact force in our controller, which is now it's an impedance controller that degenerates uh, to a much simpler one when we used also nonlinear terms in the impedance model and the reference motion in the impedance model is constant. So XD is a constant. So for doing, uh, for understanding what happens, only for the analysis, so so far we have not mentioned how uh, contact forces are being generated from the environment and will appear in the model. We have only uh, measured them if we would like to change the apparent inertia and we don't need even to measure them if we use uh, an impedance model with the Cartesian inertia of the robot instead. So for analysis now we assume that we have uh, an elastic contact model. So we will have uh, forces generated by the fact that we are entering inside the environment, the environment is placed in this formulation in a position Xe, and we have a stiffness through which the environment is reacting to small deformation. Now this um, stiffness matrix Ke may not be strictly positive definite because in some direction we don't have any contact force arising. In some other direction, the value of Ke is certainly positive. So where we are really in the direction where we are really entering the environment. So we use this expression for Fa. And in order to understand what happened with the closed loop system, uh, we modify the previous uh, Lyapunov candidate by taking the same candidate as in the free motion, but adding some other uh, energy term, potential energy term, which is associated to the deformation of the environment. And this will be a quadratic term in the deformation with the matrix uh, K of E uh, inside this term. So the new Lyapunov candidate V2 will be V1 plus this term. 
Now, one should look at where this Lyapunov yeah, function now has its minimum, and if this minimum is zero, it will not be in the desired configuration xt, but it will also not be in the contact position xe where the end effector of the robot enters in contact with the environment. There will be a different minimum for this diagonal function. We will get, uh, we'll explain where it is in a moment. But if we take the time derivative, we end up again with a, a semi-definite um, negative uh, function. And using, again, LaSalle, we can conclude about stability of the equilibrium point, the point where the Lyapunov candidate has its minimum. And in fact, if we look at the closed-loop system at the equilibrium, uh, we will realize that all the velocity and all the acceleration are, are gone, the gravity has been compensated, so what remains is just the balance between the stiffness of the controller, which is Km times xd minus x, so with respect to the desired position, and the stiffness of the environment, which has been modeled as a force that is proportional through the gain Ke to the deformation xe minus x. So uh, the equilibrium at this point will be unique because you can solve this equation for x and you will find uh, a value of x which we label as x capital E which is exactly a form which is a combination of the desired position and the point of contact xe uh, in which the robot enters uh, in contact with the environment. Now this xe will be in fact exactly the minimum of the Lyapunov candidate B2. So the, our previous analysis uh, showed that this minimum, uh, this particular position, is uh, the equilibrium and is the asymptotically stable equilibrium of the robot in contact with such environment under the action of a modified impedance control. So uh, LaSalle concludes that this is the asymptotically stable equilibrium. Now if you look at the expression of X capital E, pay attention now, I would like not to confuse the capital E which stands for equilibrium to the small e as subscript which stands for environment. Unfortunately I'm abusing <laughs> terminology but uh, it is quite clear if you look at this expression that this equilibrium uh, when the environment is sufficiently rigid, more rigid than how stiff is your controller, so when Ke is much larger than Km, then this equilibrium will be close to the surface of the environment, which means that we will not deform the environment because uh, not too much, because large deformation will be associated with very large contact force. So this is something that we want always to avoid within an impedance scheme. On the other side, if the environment is much softer than the controller, so the controller is the rigid one, so Km is much larger than Ke, from the above expression of the equilibrium X capital E, sub capital E, we will see that this position will be close to the desired value xd. So we are getting uh, quite at the desired destination by deforming uh, the environment, uh, provided that the rigid controller is sufficiently stiff. Of course, if the environment is stiff and we make the controller even more stiffer, then, although it's true that the equilibrium will be close to the destination xd, the resulting force that can be computed will be very large anyway. So uh, there's a, a good choice would be, again, not to try to overcome a stiff environment with an even stiffer uh, controller by the choice of Km. So this type of control law, so compensation of gra uh, cancellation of gravity plus PD control with the gain chosen according to the expected stiffness of the environment is also called in the literature compliance control. 
which is a subcase, as we have seen, of an impedance control when the reference trajectory in the impedance model is constant, when we have chosen as apparent inertia the uh, actual Cartesian inertia of the end effector, and when the Km has been chosen in the model, has been chosen depending on the expected stiffness Ka, Ke of the environment. Uh, we're getting slowly to an end. Now, there's another uh, simplification that we can perform. Uh, supposing that gravity is compensated or cancelled mechanically, uh, supposing also that there's no damping term, and supposing that the deformation, so the difference between the actual desired position and the, uh, um, the desired position and the actual position is small, then we can approximate this variation in Cartesian position with a variation in the joint space multiplied by the Jacobi, like we do for velocity, we do for this transformation with small uh, displacement. So the Jacobian is there anyway. So the control law, it becomes simply the following one. The dm term is gone to zero, uh, we have a J transpose in front, and we have Km times Xd minus X, which is replaced by Jacobian time uh, Kd minus Q, which simply shows that if we are imposing a constant stiffness in the Cartesian space, through the equivalence uh, J transpose times Km times J as a new configuration dependent stiffness in the joint space, we are saying that the constant stiffness in the Cartesian space is equivalent to a configuration-dependent stiffness applied to uh, small errors between the current configuration and the desired one associated with the Cartesian uh, value xd. So, uh, this type of uh, understanding shows that uh, what we are doing is the active equivalence of an RCC device. So we are reacting uh, by the choice of a diagonal Km to forces with small displacement in the direction of the applied force because we have chosen a constant and diagonal Cartesian level stiffness. This is associated to the fact that in the joint space the actual displacement is multiplied by a stiffness matrix, which is configuration dependent instead. Now, uh, there's a nice way of considering this type of mapping if we look at the relation between stiffness and transformation of forces. So, as we said, uh, a compliant controller, or a stiffness controller in this case, uh, react with forces to displacement. So, we have a sign, uh, a sign in this case to small displacement the x, which is the variation with respect to desired position xd at the Cartesian level, the generation of a force which is proportional through Km to this type of displacement. In this sense, this is exactly the opposite of what happens with uh, an RCC device, which generates a displacement in reaction to a force. But the mapping is one-to-one -one because Km is diagonal, so in every direction we have this type of behavior. This is what we call, in fact, stiffness control. Uh, with this in mind, however, we know that uh, this day x may be computed through the previous formula as a, the Jacobian times a small variation in the joint space. And similarly, that the force at the Cartesian level through the Jacobian transpose becomes uh, a torque at the joint level. So if we go around this way, which is exactly what the formula is saying before, so u is j a transpose f, and f is k m d x, and the x is j a d q, so u is j transpose k m j times d q. So if we go around this circle, this is equivalent of having uh, a configuration dependent uh, stiffness at the joint level, which associates to a variation of position, delta Q, with respect to the desired reference, a torque in reaction as a control.
Now, the same is true uh, when we reverse the order. When we are having some constant definition of the joint space, what happens then at the Cartesian level? However, this inverse relation, so the vice versa, uh, applies, but not working with stiffnesses, but with their inverses, so with their compliance. So suppose that we have uh, a torque applied at the joint level, and this induces a joint displacement. And we can choose this compliance, Cm, as a diagonal matrix. So every torque generates an associated displacement at the joint level and not at the other joints. So if we start, this is exactly in blue, is exactly what we started from in red in the other diagram. And now uh, we move this joint torque in the Cartesian space. We assume that the system is square, so that we have a square Jacobian. So uh, if uh, tor joint torques uh, are the uh, are coming from forces pre-multiplied by J A transpose, Cartesian forces are coming from joint torques by the inverse of the Jacobian transpose. And similarly, uh, this, uh, this uh, type of um, law can be realized, uh, I mean, the, the, sorry, the delta Q is associated to delta X through the inverse of the Jacobian uh, matrix. And now if we do the round in this way and we would like to complete the cycle, so going from U to delta Q without going directly in the joint space, then we have to associate a compliance, so a, rela a relation between a force and the displacement now, so a force generate the displacement uh, in the Cartesian space through uh, 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 a C of X, which is um, position dependent. So uh, the relation now goes from U to delta Q, and, it's the, and it's the, when we impose a CM constant and diagonal in the joint space, we are in fact imposing a configuration dependent uh, compliance in the Cartesian space going the uh, counterclockwise rotation in this diagram. Okay, so uh, this was the active counterpart of the remote center of compliance. So this is in fact a, a stiffness control which is seen as a subcase of the impedance control in the general setting, having made a number of choices of simplification of regulation uh, task inside the impedance scheme. I would like to conclude now with uh, another way of looking at things. So, so far we have always considered as the input command to a robot some torque that the motor should apply. Uh, in a control architecture this torque commanded is typically realized for electrical motors by imposing some current at the motors because we know that torques are proportional to the current and knowing the uh, current to torque conversion factor uh, all our uh, torque level design controller uh, are implemented by imposition of a specific current. If this is not possible, we have a closed control architecture, and in fact we can only command kinematic quantities and rely on a low-level uh, controller, then what can we do in the presence of uh, interaction with the environment? Then this is the situation in which we use admittance control. And admittance control, uh, as we have said, uh, is, uh, relates contact forces to velocity commands. Okay? And the implementation, using exactly compliant matrices, as we have seen in the second diagram of the previous slide, can be made either at the velocity or at the incremental position level, and can be realized either at the joint or at the Cartesian and task space. Remember that we end up with some command, which is a kinematic command, either a velocity or an incremental position. 
For instance, if we assume that the relation between a contact force uh, and a, a contact, uh, an associated joint torque is given by the Jacobian transpose, and then we command a velocity q dot, which will be realized by the low-level controller, close controller of our robot, and this relation will be a function of the command, uh, commanded torque u. So uh, we will have a C of Q, which is a compliant matrix generating the Q dot. And we, if we put these things together, we will see that by choosing a, a non-negative, typically positive definite uh, compliance matrix in the joint space, the contact force will be transformed into uh, a command in velocity. So if we see a force pushing the end effector, this and we can measure, we measure this force, this will move the uh, joints uh, through this relation, C of Q, which is a gain matrix, in fact, time the Jacobian transpose. And this is what is called admittance control, which is now designed with a matrix at the level of joint. Uh, the same thing could be done if instead of generating directly a velocity command, we generate uh, an incremental position command which is added to the current Q and constitute the new position reference for the low-level control. Uh, a similar consideration can be done in terms of Cartesian task. Now we assign a compliance at the Cartesian level, so when we have, once we have a, a contact force, uh, we measure this contact force, we associate a desired compliance at the Cartesian level, so we generate a velocity in response to this contact force uh, by a C of X matrix, again positive semi-definite because in some direction we would like not to react, so in those directions say X is zero, C of Q or C of X are typically chosen as diagonal, and now uh, once we have generated this X dot, supposing that we have uh, a non-redundant robot, we invert this velocity command and we generate the Q dot or the delta Q if you wish as before. So we have J to the minus one times the compliance uh, at the Cartesian level in reaction to the Cartesian force F of C. And if the robot is redundant, we just replace uh, J to the minus one with the pseudo inverse and we realize what is called admittance control now uh, with a, an admittance or a compliant matrix which is defined in, in terms of the Cartesian or task space. And with this we complete this type of uh, control for handling the interaction. We have seen many variants. Uh, in the next lecture we will move to the case of uh, hybrid control where we are controlling explicitly both the force and the motion typically in the presence of a stiff environment. We will see that we can also complement impedance with a hybrid controller uh, when we are dealing with the control of forces in the direction that our hybrid scheme uh, imposes. Thank you for listening.